This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. David Murray, Assistant Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and Clinical Biochemist in the Protein Immunology Laboratory here at Mayo Clinic to have a discussion about multiple myeloma testing. So thanks for joining us today, Dr. Murray. Ah, oh, thanks for having me. All right. Well, let's kind of get started with, uh, you know, why is it important to update multiple myeloma testing? I think we've been doing this for a while, eh? Yeah, I think the lab here at Mayo started in 1964. So we have been doing it, but there haven't been much changes since then. But really, uh, what's changed is not so much the need for testing, but it's the, the way the treatment has changed over the years. Mm -hmm. I like to refer to one of my colleagues who's a hematologist, Dr. Dispenzeri, who said when she joined the Mayo myeloma practice, there wasn't any real chemotherapy to treat patients with. But over the years now, uh, there's been an explosion of types of chemotherapies from proteasome inhibitors to autologous stem cell transplants. And now most recently, the therapeutic monoclonal antibodies and CAR T cells, all these are pushing patients to lower and lower levels of disease burden. And uh, in the past, multiple myeloma has always been considered an incurable disease, and it still is today. But now the question is, well, maybe it's time to start trying to push for cure in multiple myeloma. So in order to do that, we need testing that's able to tell us when someone's actually cured. Uh, so it's interesting. So it's it's um, it really kind of dives into really multiple areas that laboratory testing can be helpful, right? So in terms of uh, you're talking about the treatments changing and so lab testing, uh, driving some of the that treatment that's being done. And then at the end there, you mentioned also to define a cure. Yeah, so uh, what we know now among the traditional serum testing within multiple myeloma is not really capable of going to low enough levels to detect what we call minimal residual disease in patients. So what has changed is that a lot of people now have gone to bone marrow biopsies to look for minimal residual disease. So they use things like high sensitivity flow cytometry or next gen sequencing to go across the hemoglobin gene that's in the plasma cells in the cancer itself in order to detect the disease. And so while that's good, bone marrow biopsies are both expensive, uh, you can't do a lot of those on a patient because of their expense and the pain to the patient. So really, when we sought out to develop a new test, we wanted to do a serum-based test that was more sensitive so that we could help the patients not to have multiple bone marrow biopsies in order to look for this minimal residual disease. So we have kind of a diversity of audience listeners. So from physicians in practice to laboratory medicine pathologists or professionals, excuse me, and uh, in students. So maybe can we just back up and kind of take that 30,000 foot view? And sure. Could you kind of give a little bit of an explanation about uh, kind of multiple myeloma, how that initial testing started and how that's evolved? Yeah, that's a great question, especially being here at Mayo where, you know, the M spike, the traditional M spike that we all look for in the lab was actually defined here by Robert Kyle. So uh, as we, as a lot of people know, this is a disease of plasma cells. So plasma cells are the end stage of a B cell development, right? Especially since COVID, everybody knows a little bit about antibodies or immunoglobulins. So these plasma cells are the end response to Anytime you're insulted with an infectious agent, you can make an antibody. These plasma cells then differentiate themselves and kind of go to the end stage and become a factory to make these immunoglobulins for us. So sometimes though, these plasma cells, just like any other cell in the body can become cancerous. Uh, and when they do, they overproduce this immunoglobulin. And that's really the basis of detecting multiple myelomas, looking for these overexpressed immunoglobulins within the patient's uh, serum. And traditionally this was done by uh, electrophoretic uh, mobility. So we place the patient's serum on the gel and then apply a differential charge across that. And since immunoglobins are designed to stick to the normal proteins, they tend to have more positive charge. So they migrate all the way to the end near the, the cathode of the electrophoresis. 
And because we have this uh, diverse population of immunogams, we make this broad sort of uh, repertoire of immunogams. But one in, once one of these cancers go, one of these plasma cells become cancerous, they overexpress and they make something we call the M protein, which stands for myeloma protein. And so this has been the basis for a long time, the serum protein electrophoresis and uh, immunofixation uh, electrophoresis, the subtype it, these have been the basis of myeloma or my testing for myeloma. So uh, uh, what, what needed to happen though, is that these methods because of the polyclone background needed to get increased sensitivity. And that's really what we started out with this new test that we're gonna talk about today. We started out really trying to increase the sensitivity of the serum detection of this uh, M protein. And we ended up using mass spectrometry to do that. One thing maybe our listeners might find a little confusion with is you're talking about a, a cancer cell that's going to be overexpressing uh, this M protein. So can you talk, like, why are you talking about you need more sensitivity to uh, detect it? Well, uh, the polyclonal background, so to detect an M protein, uh, you have to find it above the polyclonal background. And that's mm. true when you're screening for multiple myeloma. But once you know what that M protein is, then you can follow it. Even if it goes below the polyclonal background, as the patient gets treated and the plasma cell burden drops, sometimes that M protein will drop into the polyclonal background. But if you had methods in order to pull that out of there, then, then that would make it more and more sensitive. So that's really was the idea behind uh, our new testing that we did. Yeah, that's brilliant. So I really get a clear picture now of, you know, uh, I may have multiple myeloma, but I also have other immunoglobulins. And so you're having to separate signal from noise. And I understand yeah. how you can do that initially, but then you're talking as you treat a patient, it might then you, you can no longer uh, separate that signal from noise, but with your new technique, you're able to really hang on to where is that signal, even though it drops really low. Yeah. And that was the beauty of mass spectrometry because it produces a mass, a mass that we can follow. So because each antibody has a slightly different amino acid sequence, then that amino acid sequence gives you a unique mass and you can use that unique mass in order to detract that immunoglobin, sometimes even when it goes below the polyclonal background. So how does this relate then to, or at the beginning, you mentioned that uh, this might help uh, drive treatment decisions. Could you kind of elaborate on that? So in the past, you know, multiple myelomas we talked about was considered incurable. So the treatment decisions were really just based off this uh, symptoms of the patient. But now that's all being brought into question, at least uh, uh, there are some groups now starting to decide, okay, we want to keep treating these patients until all evidence of the disease is gone. So that's where this MRD testing has come in. Now, it's not fully established yet, but the studies are underway now to kind of push for a cure in multiple myeloma, which was thought not capable in the past. Mm -hmm. So the way this test now will work, and it's, uh, uh, it's not totally that we're going to treat everybody to zero MRD, but it's allowing us to look at the serum and see when the patient's got no evidence of their plasma cells or their multiple myeloma cells uh, in, their, in their body anymore. So I think in the long term, once we do get there, and hopefully we will get there, we'll make these decisions, we'll at least have a serum-based method in order to follow these patients for treatment. I see. So what does this look like uh, in practice? Is this something where we're still doing the traditional look for the M spike, you know, once that's established as a diagnosis, then we follow it up to get the fingerprint for the particular patient's myeloma? Uh, in Mayo, we've sort of replaced electrophoresis for the most part uh, by using this mass spec method. And in the beginning, when you're screening, what you do is you mass profile all the immunoglobulins. And just like you do on electrophoresis, if one is overexpressed, meaning if there's a dysregulated plasma cell, we see it, as I always say, looks like a giraffe in a cornfield, right? You kind of see it overproduced and they're very easy to see. And then as the patient gets treated, then we can then follow it uh, further because we have that mass marker. So yes, we, you know, the electrophoretic methods are still adequate. You can still screen with them. I don't think, but the real benefit of this method is twofold. One was the uh, 
the ability to attract people to lower levels and the ability to automate it and make it into a modern lab test with higher throughput and uh, more efficient workflow efficiency than uh, traditional electrophoresis. That's really another benefit that we haven't even really touched on yet. But for the lab, the throughput by this mass spec method is, is much better than our traditional gel base that we did here at Mayo. So for us uh, who might be laboratory professionals, I'm kind of curious, it sounds like maybe there was one question or one primary kind of uh, driver looking the, at, at looking at this as a way to test uh, in my, multiple myeloma, but then there have been uh, additional uh, aspects that have kind of become realized. And yeah. I'm curious if you could kind of just tell us that story. Yeah, so we started out looking for an, uh, an MRD-based method. That's what that we started minimal looking at, minimal yeah. residual disease, looking for a more sensitive serum-based test, yes. And uh, so we started and we used these very, uh, as you know, there are many different types of mass spectrometers out there. Some have more resolution than the others. So we use this very high resolution, what's called a time of flight instrument uh, that we were able to uh, use liquid chromatography and do all this thing to get the sensitivity maximized in order to detect the M protein at its lower level. But along the way, we realized we could adopt this to a multi-TOF mass spectrometer. Those multi-TOF multi mass spectrometers now have been used in the lab. They're used in microbiology. They're very, uh, in my, uh, they're very efficient. They're easy to maintain. So we were able to make a method that has a slightly lower resolution than what we would use for detecting low level disease in order to do our screening assay. And so these multi-top mass spectrometers, you can uh, collect data within 10 seconds, right? Compared to a half hour electrophoresis. And all of a sudden we went from uh, looking for just minimal residual disease to a new method that would really rapidly screen patients. So in reality, this mass spec method, we have two, two methods. We use one on a low resolution for screening where you wanna be because you don't wanna uh, over detect too many small clones in healthy people. But on the flip side, we have a high resolution that we can then look for low residual disease, but they complement each other because mass is a fundamental property of matter. So once you have the mass, then you can follow that over time. You know, one of the things I've always uh, admired about you, and I, I, I apologize, I didn't share in the introduction, is I believe your background, you were a, an industrial chemist before going to, to medical school. And I, I'm kind of curious, because uh, you have always impressed me, David, is, is like an outside the box uh, thinker. And I'm kind of curious about how do you see that background uh, impacting your practice today? Yeah, it's quite interesting. I give a lecture to our PhD candidates who come into the lab because when you do your PhD first, like I did, you know all these modern techniques and you think in medicine, they're gonna be using the most modern technique. And that's not always true in medicine because we have to move slowly because there's patients' health and lives at stake. So you can't just make radical jumps, but I remember coming into the lab with my background as a PhD chemist and looking at gels and going, I can't believe we're still using gels in this day and age with all the types of equipment that are out there. So that's really uh, kind of what happened when I was a resident. I saw that and I stayed the course and went into the lab. I didn't think we'd get this far, but we actually made it pretty far with some of the, the newer techniques. And I also say uh, laziness is always good for invention too, because I always say it's easier to create the literature than read the literature. So that was always something else I always say. So <laughs> I think that's brilliant. I think that's something for our, our uh, student uh, listener uh, viewership to uh, kind of put a pin in, right? As they're kind of going through their process of, of uh, discovering who they are. Yeah. Uh, this next question isn't meant to be dismissing. I, I'm kind of curious as far as like what's, What's next uh, for this? What's the next step? It sounds like you've done a lot of work developing and it sounds like you've kind of done some work on optimizing, but also like what's the next step in, in uh, kind of fully realizing this in clinical practice? Uh, well, one thing that I, we haven't talked about yet, but you know, I always say with new eyes, you see new things and the mass spectrometer gave us new eyes. And one of the things we didn't fully appreciate about M proteins is that some of these 
M proteins turned out to have post-translation modifications on their immunoglobulin light chain. Now it's well known that uh, glycosylation happens on the heavy chain, but now we've seen that 5% of the patients who have an M protein have light chain glycosylation. And at first it made the test a little less desirable because it shifted the mass out of the normal mass of a light chain, made it a little more complex, but uh, we've been able to investigate that. And what we found is that some of the patients who have this light chain glycosylation, they have a higher risk for developing a disease called AL amyloidosis. Now, AL amyloidosis is a fairly rare disease, and it's due, to, it's due to the fact that some of these immunoglobin light chains will form plaques within the patient's body, these protein plaques that precipitate into their heart and to other organs and really ruin the function of those organs. And that disease is rare enough that it rarely, it, it goes undetected for years because it doesn't enter the mind of a lot of clinicians right off the bat because it's so rare. And these patients don't present with the large M proteins like you do for myeloma, they present with really small ones. So the detection of these glycosylated light chains has been a, an interesting finding that we're just starting to appreciate. Uh, we also found that for certain patients, since you're a blood bank guy, uh, some of these patients that have M proteins with light chain glycosylation are actually the ones getting the cold agglutin disease, not just cold agglutins, but cold agglutin disease. And a study we did here uh, with your group, and uh, it showed that 60% of the patients who have a an, an, uh, monoclonal protein related cold agglutin disease had light chain glycosylation. So that was also another interesting finding that we didn't have before. So those are things that need further investigation. And uh, I look forward to kind of seeing we can understand the mechanism of that. Oh, it's fascinating to kind of see how this, uh, you know, uh, this new testing strategy, that initial intent of finding and tracking uh, minimal residual disease is now helping you identify all these subtypes uh, and or associations uh, to look for and hopefully translates into better care and that people don't have to, uh, with the example of amyloidosis, like you mentioned, I mean, you know, the, over the years of uh, plaques uh, building up in organs without being uh, addressed uh, really can make a meaningful difference for patients. Yeah, we hope so. Oh. All right. We've been rounding with uh, Dr. Murray. Thank you so much for taking the time to discuss multiple myeloma for us. I think that you've kind of exploded this concept for our listeners on how uh, one test can really give you new eyes and, and new perspectives. Sure. Thank you. And to all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations. Mm -hmm.